This is Money Guide with Mary Stirk from Stirk Financial Services. Now, here's Mary Stirk. Welcome to Money Guide with Mary Stirk. And today our topic is brain disease and money. So you might think that that's kind of a strange topic for a radio show, but the truth is that many people who are listening either have some level of um, brain disease themselves or know or love someone that does or have had experience with that in the past. And so we wanted to do a show to help the listeners out there understand what things to look for when it comes to brain disease and then how to begin to help somebody that you see suffering from that with their finances so that you can head off or avoid problems that happen specifically to people and their money when they have a brain disease. So with me today, I have Kelsey Banky. Welcome, Kelsey. Thank you, Mary. And Kelsey has um, been with Stark Financial for over seven years. She's a certified financial planner, and she actually has worked very closely with a number of our families who have had to deal with someone that they love that has a brain disease. And the um, issues and the experience that she's built as a result of that have helped us understand this topic at an entirely different level and helped us build out some programming that helps caregivers and people who are helping those with brain disease really dig into and be able to organize, enhance, and then prevent problems happening on the financial side. It can have such a big impact on a family and and emotionally, physically for the person dealing with it. There's a lot of things, but um, what I'm seeing very frequently is the person left to pick up the pieces for the person whose brain disease is causing them to no longer be able to handle their finances is often being handled by somebody who maybe isn't confident with finances themselves. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so not only do you have to understand how to transition those assets in in a way that makes everybody feel comfortable, but it, it requires a lot of learning um, for the people who are starting to take over the assets. And that, that's not always the case. You know, sometimes a child stepping in who feels really good about handling things, but so often it's the other spouse um, stepping in to help handle things. So what I, I think is is crucial is just being aware of what um, can be difficult for someone with brain disease. And, it, and it's not always obvious. They could be very, very comfortable and for lack of better words, normal in so much of their life. And then certain things that they've done every day for their whole life might start to trip them up. And so it's a very delicate process right. to work through. But if you work through it, you can, like Mary said, prevent some big problems that are, are difficult to undo. Um, with finances. So one of the things that is a kind of harbinger of some brain disease is when you start to notice memory loss issues um, in someone that you love. And that's probably one of the most common symptoms. And, you know, I'm not talking about memory loss like, oh, you forgot to go to an appointment today or gosh, I can't remember my car keys are because you know what? That happens to all of us. <laughs> but when you notice that you're forgetting information or somebody's forgetting information that they actually recently learned, or if they're repeatedly asking for the same information over and over, or if you forget the name of someone that you're close to, like a friend, then that is a sign that perhaps there could be some starting of the memory loss that's associated with some of the brain diseases that are out there. Now, you can imagine that when somebody starts to have memory loss, then they're going to not remember whether or not they may have paid the bills that they were supposed to pay. And so one of the key things that you can do to help someone who has started to exhibit signs of brain disease is to help do two things. Number one, understand and organize their cash flow with them. And number two, establish a bill paying system. So Kelsey, share a little bit about what kind of things go into the somewhat unique task of trying to understand and organize somebody else's cash flow. <laughs> 
Uh, depending on how close you are to the person you're trying to help, you might not know what all money's coming in. And you definitely might not know all the money that needs to go out or the frequency and things like that. The, the good news is it is very much a system. Things are usually um, happening on a regular, predictable basis. So you can create a system to manage all of this. Um, but it, it might take a couple months to sort it all out, depending at what point you're stepping in. If the person you're helping is at the early stages of a brain disease, um, they can be very, very helpful as long as they're willing to work with you on this. They can be very helpful, obviously, in, in doing that. And then you're just stepping in to maybe provide some structure to it so that you could step in and help if you needed to. If somebody that you're trying to help is a little further into their brain disease um, and isn't able to provide as um, good of information for you, then you might have to be a little bit of a detective. Um, but looking at bank statements, looking at um, tax returns, things like that will help you identify what kind of income sources are coming in and also help you identify what expenses need to be paid and who those need to be paid to. Now we actually have built a wonderful tool for caregivers that is a budget tool. Now I totally understand that the word budget is a horrible word for many people to have to think about. <laughs> Nobody loves budgeting. <laughs> No. <laughs> but in order to really wrap your hands around somebody else's cash flow, you do need a place to kind of organize your information about what money is coming in and then also what money needs to go out. So if you would like to have a copy of that budget planning tool that we've created, then you can reach out to us at Sterk Financial Services and ask us for a copy of it. We'd be happy to email it to you. And then we can even show you like where to put information in so it can assist you in your journey of helping understand understand and organize the cash flow. Now, one of the other symptoms that comes with brain disease, especially on the Alzheimer's side, is starting to have a reduced ability to problem solve and to plan. And so when um, when that happens, then it's going to be more difficult for that person to be able to look at a budget themselves and say, oh, I know I'm going to have these incomes coming in and I know I'm going to have these expenses going out. So the sooner that you start to see these symptoms, the better it is for you to start to create that type of budget tool so you have some records to go on while they're as helpful as possible. And along with this one on the, the ability to, to problem solve and plan, you know, assets that they do have, physical assets like a home or a vehicle, things like that, they can have a tendency to neglect upkeep or um, certain improvements that need to be made on a fairly regular basis. Um, so in addition to managing the uh, financial assets, managing the physical assets and, and paying attention to that as well um, is important. You know, they might not have regular maintenance done. They might not have um, certain things that can then cause, again, cause problems down the road if you're not watching out for them. Very good points, Kelsey. So, okay, another symptom that we frequently see happen is that daily activities can become more challenging. So if you're noticing a loved one, um, maybe last time they went to the grocery store, they were a little unsure how to get home, or maybe you were doing an activity like knitting, and that's something that they've done for years, but all of a sudden they were confused about what they were actually needing to do to complete their knitting, then those kind of tasks that they, they know how to do, but all of a sudden have confusion on, can be an indicator that these daily activities are becoming more challenging. So imagine that translating to the financial side, that means that paying the bills has now become more challenging for them. So if you're going to be stepping in and helping a loved one with their finances and actually establishing a bill paying system um, that you stay on top of is going to be incredibly effective. A lot of it can be done electronically now. A lot of it can be set up automatically. And once you've wrapped your hands around what the cash flow needs are, then you can move towards setting up a bill pay system so things don't get missed or fall through the cracks. Along the same lines is the record keeping system. Mm -hmm. So um, a filing system that they may have had for years is no longer something that they can um, think through as clearly and then documents are not going where they should be or getting missed altogether. And, and that might not seem like a big deal until it's time to do taxes. 
and you don't have the documents that you need to help them file taxes. So uh, keep that in mind as well that that if they're unable to do some other simple tasks that they are used to doing that systems they have built might not be getting followed through as well as they have been in the past. Okay, another common symptom of brain disease is reduced visual perception for people. So people who are developing Alzheimer's often experience significant changes in vision and spatial recognition. And, you know, this can be more than just trying to read a book and not being able to see the words. Often in the early stages of Alzheimer's, people will start to misjudge distances or they'll struggle to see contrasting colors. So one of the things that you can do as a financial caregiver for someone is to record some key information and then keep it in an easily accessible space. You want to keep copies with you, but you also want to keep copies in an easily accessible space. So what do we mean by that? What are some of the key pieces of information you would want to record? Um, information, just their social security number, date of birth, all of those things. Um, Medicare information, yep. doctor's information, prescription drug information. Yep, all of that. Who, which, what, who are the doctors and the professionals that they're working with? Having that information readily available to you. Um, things that you might need to file uh, for different benefits. So like... One that people don't always think about if they weren't in the military themselves, but a DD-214 or, um, you know, their discharge papers will allow them to get benefits to the VA and things like that if that's in their history. Um, Pension information, union information, things like that. One of the best tips that I've heard from the recording the key information piece is not only to keep it, like I said, a copy with you, but also to put a copy into some type of very brightly colored envelope or folder and have it either hanging on the fridge or hanging somewhere near the front door. So if there happens to be a medical emergency and um, emergency personnel come in, um, then it's easy to grab that information and so you have it at your fingertips or it's easy for them to grab it so they have it at their fingertips. Yeah, and that you want to have, you know, their their information, anything that the, the hospital might be asking for, but also the prescriptions. That's the big one in that in that envelope um, so that when they're helping your loved one and possibly transporting them to a medical facility, they know what prescriptions they um, have been prescribed and might be taking. Right. And and being clear about like where to find this stuff, it's not going to be effective at certain stages in brain disease to say, well, here's the file cabinet and here's where all that information is. It needs to be easily accessible because finding things and remembering where things are starts to become more and more of a challenge. Congratulations to Mary Stirk and the team at Stirk Financial for earning a spot on multiple Forbes lists for seven years running, including 2018 to 2024 Forbes Best in State Wealth Advisors, 2018 to 2021 Forbes Top Women Wealth Advisors, and 2022 to 2024 Forbes Best in State Women, number one in South Dakota. Welcome back to Money Guide with Mary Stirk. And today we're talking about brain disease and money and how um, certain aspects of different brain diseases cause issues that create problems in the financial side of life. And if you are um, in charge of or taking care of or know that you might be in the future, need to be helping with someone that's suffering from a brain disease, then these helpful tips are going to be very important for you to be paying attention to. All right, one of the symptoms of brain disease is um, changes in mood to where there's some personality altering type of things. So those who are suffering from Alzheimer's generally experience changes in both their mood and their personality. They're frequently suspicious of any change that happens or people that they encounter. Sometimes they're forgetting who the people are and then very suspicious, even though they might have dealt with them quite a bit in the past. So the changes in mood and that suspicion level um, make it important for you as a financial caregiver to be paying attention to and really familiarize yourself with the investments that someone has. And there are some really specific reasons why I think that's important. Number one, the suspicion that the person dealing with the brain disease might have could be being cast on the wrong people. Like they might all of a sudden become suspicious of their financial advisor 
And that's a, you know, a symptom of the brain disease. Whereas if you're familiar with the investments as the financial caregiver, then you're going to be able to make sure you build a relationship with that financial advisor and understand why things are set up the way they are and be mindful of what changes might need to happen down the road. Absolutely. You know, understanding why a particular investment was made the way it was made. Um, there's there's always an, a plan when, when an investment is started and understanding what that plan was so that um, it can be seen through or changed if things change because everything should be fluid and be able to, to do that. Um, but it, it can be difficult to step in right after, after that set in. So um, – keep in mind you need to really understand the full picture of, of assets in order to, to make a good judgment on that. The other thing that kind of goes into this one, as well as the fact that another symptom of brain disease is that language can often become frustrating. And um, if you're struggling to contribute to the conversation in a way that you might have before, or you might be thinking something, but you're not able to verbalize that, that combined with the changes in mood can create and wreak havoc in estate planning. So somebody may have had a very well thought out estate plan, and then the brain disease could create shifts in what they are wanting to do in their estate plan, which could be a problem. Or if they've never had an estate plan, <laughs> then what they may desire to do when they're symptomatic could be completely out of left field and not within the bounds of what their normal decisions might have been. I have seen this. I've seen this multiple times where people um, set out a plan prior to brain disease for how they wanted their estate planning to go. And then years later wanted to make some pretty radical changes, but a lot of those other symptoms were there and, mm -hmm. it, and it was brain disease causing them to want to make changes. And I'm not saying they can't make changes, but when they're radically departing from what their original plan was, um, it, it can just, it can cause some concern. So, um, we're frequently talking about caregivers, but people who um, who are aging, who have brain disease in their family, who know that that could be a risk that could be in their, their near future, things that you do ahead of time to plan and prepare and get all of your ducks in a row prior to something like that setting in can really be a nice gift for your family. It is a wonderful gift. Because they, your family doesn't want to have to... to force your hand at some things just to make sure that you're, you're financially, you know, sound and secure. Um, so if you're having that, you know, I, I know it's nobody else's business, what your finances are is, is the way a lot of people think about it, but you do have to address what happens at the time that you can't handle those things anymore. Who's going to be that person that helps you with it and start talking to them about these kind of things prior to it being a crisis. Right, exactly. So working with your loved one to make sure that their estate planning ducks are in a row, that wills are set up, that financial power of attorney is set up so you as the caregiver can help make decisions and things like that. Because let me tell you, if you don't have a financial power of attorney in place and the one you love is no longer competent to carry out their own you know, financial wishes, then you're going to have to go to court to get appointed to do that. And that can be a lengthy and expensive process. So you want to have that financial power of attorney in place. All right. So one of the symptoms that we frequently see with brain disease is um, kind of a combination of a couple things I want to talk about. So one is having difficulty with places and time. So people forget where they are. They struggle to understand what day it is. It's normal to think it's like Friday um, when it's a wrong day, but what's not normal, like you might think it's Friday and realize, oh, it's Thursday, but it's not normal to think that it's Friday in 2018 and they're thinking that it's Friday in 2001, you know, their, their time frame is off. There are People with brain diseases often start to lose things too. And when they lose things, we all lose things. But what um, someone with Alzheimer's struggles with is that it's difficult for them to retrace their steps to try to find it. And so all of those type of things, because it's a spatial orientation thing and it's, a, it's got time and place connected to it, really ends up playing into living conditions and living arrangements. So 
right now, the one that you love with a brain disease might be okay to be living at home or living on their own. However, there probably will come a point in time where a new living arrangement has to be made. And as many of the decisions that can be made ahead of time as possible, the better off everyone is, especially if you're having conversations with them ahead of time about what their wishes are, like where do they really want to live down the road? Now, I think that there are lots of good options for people to go to or to get help from, but none of them are inexpensive. No, they're very expensive. (laughs) So if an assisted living is necessary, if a memory care unit is necessary, things like that, maybe even just a nursing unit, especially if your um, brain disease is causing more physical symptoms versus um, cognitive symptoms, then you really need to be thinking about evaluating future living arrangements and tying that to the financial planning. And that's really where a good financial planner can help, especially if they understand the situation. They can help you go through understanding and organizing the cash flow, help you establish that bill paying system, make sure the estate planning ducks are in a row, and then look at and forecast, here's what the investments are, and here's how that translates to different living options in the future when a higher level of care might be needed. Okay, so we've talked about a number of different things um, in terms of what you can do to help. Um, But one of the things that I guess I'd like to just take a moment to say is that as a financial caregiver, your job is very difficult. Not only do you have the emotional side of having to watch somebody that you love or care about go through something traumatic like a brain disease, but you also are stepping into a role that can be quite confusing and often intimidating. And one of the best pieces of advice that Kelsey and I can give is make sure you take care of yourself. Your role is tough and you taking care of yourself is not selfish. I think it's very critical. It is. You can't, you know, run the marathon if you're not doing all the little steps in between um, to keep yourself healthy. And that's maybe a poor metaphor, but it, it many times is a long process. Being a financial caregiver for someone with a brain disease could be years or decades of care. Whereas a physical, a physical reason of caring for someone isn't typically as long. So um, I've it, it's just you need to take care of yourself, but also recognize that you're not the first person to ever have to do it. Right. And there's a lot of services and programs out there and resources to help you, um, help you do it, help you understand how to navigate that process, um, give you ideas on how to make things better. But also here's here's what I think is really important. Help you keep still a good relationship with that person and not have it always be that you're just taking care of them. You need to also focus on still having a a relationship with them and still um, spending time with them. You know, when my grandmother um, had a stroke and went into the Alzheimer's, she, uh, my mom would still go and just just spend time with her. And I, I really looked to that as something that I want to strive to keep in mind if I ever have to get to that position, just because it's not just about taking care of them. It's still a relationship too. There you go. Good advice, Kelsey. Well, we hope this has been good information for you as you've listened to our show on brain disease and money. And if there's anything that we can do to help you in your journey as a financial care- caregiver, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks for listening to Money Guide with Mary Stirk. Stirk Financial Services is celebrating 20 years in 2024. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of your audio provider and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities or services mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can ensure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should only be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Osaic Wealth, Inc. 
member FINRA SIPC. Insurance offered through Sturt Financial Services, which is not affiliated with Osaic Wealth. Osaic Wealth is separately owned and other entities and or marketing names, products, or services referenced here are independent of Osaic Wealth. The rankings for the Forbes Best in State Wealth Advisors list by Shook Research is based on due diligence meetings to evaluate each advisor qualitatively, a major component of a ranking algorithm that includes client retention, industry experience, review of compliance records, firm nominations, and quantitative criteria, including assets under management and review generated for their firms. The Forbes ranking of America's top women wealth advisors is based on an algorithm of qualitative and quantitative data, rating thousands of wealth advisors with a minimum of seven years of experience and weighing factors like revenue trends, assets under management, compliance records, industry experience, and best practices learned through telephone and in-person interviews. There is no fee in exchange for rankings. Forbes is a trademark of Forbes Media LLC. All rights reserved. Rankings and recognition from Forbes, Shook, Research are no guarantee of future investment success and do not ensure that a current or prospective client will experience a higher level of performance results and such rankings should not be construed as an endorsement of the advisor.